Good morning and welcome to the 13th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone to please switch off their electronic devices or switch them to silent so that they don't affect the committee's work this morning? Item 1, decision on taking business in private. Can I have agreement to take items 3 and 4 in private, please? Agreed. Thank you. Item number two is early learning and childcare. And I'd like to welcome our witnesses this morning, Paul Johnson, Director General, Education, Communities and Justice, Joe Griffin, Director for Early Learning and Childcare, Alison Cumming, Programme Lead, Early Learning and Childcare from the Scottish Government, Vicky Bibby, Chief Officer for Finance, and Jane O'Donnell, Chief Officer for Children and Young People from COSLA. Before we take evidence this morning, I'd like to place on record that I know Vicky Bibby in a personal capacity. I understand that both the Scottish Government and COSLA wish to make short opening statements, and I'll invite Mr Johnson to begin. Good morning, convener and committee, and thank you for the opportunity to give evidence this morning. The expansion of early learning and childcare is one of the most significant investments that the Scottish Government will make in the current parliamentary term, both in terms of the financial sums involved and in terms of the transformative potential. Our leadership and management of this programme will only be strengthened by the scrutiny and support that we receive from Audit Scotland and from the Parliament. The expansion of entitlement to funded early learning and childcare to 1140 hours for eligible two-year-olds and for all three and four-year-olds is central to the government's mission to give all of our children the best start in life and to close the poverty-related attainment gap. The Scottish Government and local government have worked hard to implement 600 hours of funded early learning and childcare. We're proud of what has already been achieved, though we recognise that there are always improvements that can be made. And so we're applying the learning to the implementation of 1140 hours, particularly in more clearly specifying and measuring the outcomes of expansion from the outset. Our plans for 1140 hours are progressing well and we remain on track. That is not to say that there are not challenges ahead of us, particularly in ensuring that we recruit and train the required numbers of new entrants to the workforce. I'm confident that we have robust programme management systems in place, which will help us identify and manage the risks that are ahead of us over the next two years. The agreement of a funding package with COSLA at the end of April allows local authorities to progress their local expansion plans without delay. It also demonstrates exemplary collective leadership, which has been a real and very encouraging feature of our work in this area. Within the Scottish Government, I have recently strengthened the senior leadership of the Early Learning and Child Care programme by the appointment of a director level lead, Joe Griffin, who sits alongside me. Joe is supported by a team of around 30 colleagues from the civil service and other agencies, and I'm grateful to them for their focus, which is very firmly on delivering and on realising the benefits of this expansion programme. We can only implement this expansion through positive collaboration with our partners, not only in local authorities, but also providers in the private and third sector and the many bodies who are supporting the training and development of the workforce. The expansion requires an enormous collective endeavour. It is challenging, but let us welcome the ambition and commitment to deliver improved outcomes for all of Scotland's children. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Johnson. Jane O'Donnell. Thank you, convener. COSLA officers wish to extend our thanks to the committee for the opportunity to provide information to you in relation to the recent Audit Scotland report on early learning and childcare. COSLA has a children and young people's board, which comprises elected members from all 32 local authorities, and they, alongside our COSLA Leaders Forum, have undertaken oversight of the policy work surrounding the early learning and childcare services delivered by local authorities and their partners across Scotland. 
I am the lead officer for the policy side in COSLA and my colleague Vipi Bibby to my left is the lead officer for local government finance. COSLA are clear that our focus in all areas of delivery and children's services remains on the principles of getting it right for every child and to embody the Christie Commission vision of a whole system working together on early intervention and prevention strategies via the provision of high quality public services. The report from Audit Scotland offered an important opportunity to reflect so far on the work done in partnership between Scottish Government, local government and other partners, as well as identifying some useful points for the expansion. The report showed that councils remain by far the guarantors of quality of learning, and the report recognised we have been expanding our provision in terms of flexibility since the implementation of the 600 hours date of August 2014. This is testament to the efforts by councillors and local government officers to keep children at the centre of all our decision making. Following the successful delivery of the 600 hours policy, the Care Inspector have reported that over 95% of local authority establishments receive good or better inspection reviews. In addition, many councils have been increasing the offer to children and young people with additional hours and flexibility offered on a locality basis. The expansion of early learning childcare to 11.40 hours by 2020 is no doubt a significant and challenging area of work. However, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to make a difference to the lives of our youngest children, and COSLA have supported the Scottish Government's policy intentions here since the publication of the blueprint in March 2017. Scotland's councils are now facing an ambitious expansion programme, but we are confident that we can deliver in partnership with government and with our other partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane O'Donnell. I'm going to ask Colin Beattie to open questioning for the committee. I'd like to explore some issues around workforce planning. But first, I believe there are certain elements within the Auditor General's report which are worth looking at and which I'd like some comments from. So I'll just take them one by one and ask you, and ask you to, to comment. On paragraph 26 of the Auditor General's report, the very final sentence says, there is no available information on children's attendance or the number of hours of funded ELC they receive. Isn't that a big gap in, in the figures that you should be looking at in order to project workforce? That is absolutely an area that we are addressing at present. And I'm going to invite my colleague Alison to see if she would like to say more about the work that's underway to do just that. I think this statement is referring to the national statistics that we collect each year, which are on child registrations, um, rather than uh, no. rather than on uh, at the moment the registrations with the service. We have a data transformation project, which is is well underway, um, which will see us move to child level collection um, of data um, with a, an anticipated. Uh, full start date of May 2021, although we've started um, the, the trialling of, of that approach at the moment. Um, in, in terms of attendance, um, it wouldn't necessarily be for national statistics to collect very detailed information about individual children's attendance um, at um, individual ELC settings, but we do recognise the need and in moving to child level collection, we'll be able to gain a lot more, a lot more information about the patterns of provision that children are receiving um, through their, their funded ELC and indeed whether it's split between more than one um, provider. In terms of the, the assumptions that we've made in terms of uptake, um, a lot of that's been carried out at local authority level through the um, work on the expansion plans and there's been a very thorough supply and demand analysis we might um, term it as uh, in each local authority as they, they prepare their expansion plans based on their knowledge of their local communities and their, their, local, um, th their local families as to what their likely uptake um, is to be. I mean, in, in general terms, we have near universal pr uptake in terms of registrations for three and four year olds at present. And the, the prevailing assumption is that that will continue into 1140 hours. So at the present, you have a programme underway in which you're going to capture this information. The information is available at council level, is that correct? There, there will be information available at, at council level. We have national statistics on registrations with, with services and councils will have more detailed information that they use for local planning. I mean, it seems odd to me that uh, the national statistics, which must be fed by the councils according to their figures because there's no other way to do it, that they should be highlighting this issue if the councils are actually collecting that data? 
The, the councils will have, have data that they collect through their own systems. Um, we don't have national information on, on children's attendance. We have the, the national census that's carried out as part of the, the school statistics each year, which looks at a, a, a range of measures, but at the moment it doesn't, and we don't have any plans to look specifically at attendance in terms of attendance of the, the number of sessions that, that children report for. It doesn't feel like that is something that we would consider at the moment would be appropriate for collection at, at national level. But if you're working out workforce, the workforce you're going to need to, to cope with this, surely you have to know how many children are attending and what sessions they're doing. We know how many children are attending in terms of their registrations with services. So it's, it, it's the registrations with services that determine the capacity that we need to plan for. Um, in, in terms of the expansion. Um, if, if a child then doesn't attend for a specific session, we wouldn't necessarily take that into account in, in service planning because we have to have the places available for all the children who would register. Well, Donald, did you want to add to that? Absolutely. Just to support um, what Alison uh, say, said there to, to you, Mr Beattie, is that at council level and at individual setting level, we are monitoring um, presentation and absent rates uh, for young children. We don't feed that information up nationally. To be honest, that is an area where you need quite a local professional response to families or children should there be any reason for absenteeism. So right now we don't feed that in, but I think there is definitely potential to do so in the future. As Alison rightly said, we have planned the expansion based on all our registrations attending and making sure that the staff are there to, to support the children. Just, just a couple of other items. Look at paragraph 29, bullet point one. It says that some children receive funded ELC from childminders but registration figures do not count these children. Surely this is part of the picture that uh, should be being factored in. It, it, it is a variable. It, it absolutely is, and it's something that we will be looking at in terms of the data transformation project to ensure that the statistics going forward include all types of, of service that, that children um, are access their funded ELC through and from. Um, I, I think it, it's worth noting that the, the number of childminders involved in delivering funded early learning and childcare at the moment is, is relatively low. Um, and that's something that through Moving to Funding Follows the Child, we would expect to see um, increasing um, and the, we're removing some of the barriers potentially to being able to access funded entitlement through childminders. So with that in mind, we are developing our, our data collection to ensure that we have the, the information on services provided by childminders as well. Do you have any statistics on the sort of proportion childminders would be? Um, I don't have statistics to hand. Um, I know that it's it's a very low number, and we can certainly provide the the number to the committee. Jane O'Donnell, do you have that number? I, don't have it. I, I was going to make it the same offer, which was uh, between as we can get that information to the committee. What I would say is we can see from local authority expansion plans that almost all local authorities do intend to use childminders as part of their funded entitlement provision going forward. So we'd expect that to be monitored carefully going forward. Colin uh, Beatty. Bullet point two in the same paragraph starts with, councils do not have a statutory duty to identify eligible two-year-olds and their parents. How is that being handled? Well, I can pick that one up. Um, we need to remember that clearly it is not mandatory for any two-year-olds to attend uh, early learning and childcare provision. Uh, what, we've, what, what we've made available is the possibility of, el of eligible two-year-olds um, attending early learning and childcare. And what we're seeking to do is ensure that those who are eligible are made aware of their eligibility and are given every opportunity to attend. Now, that requires a wide range of local activity. And we can see uh, some very successful local initiatives taking place to try and highlight the availability of early learning and childcare for eligible two-year-olds. However, as the report identifies, and as has been um, set out previously in Parliament, there are further improvements that could be made in relation to data sharing, particularly information from HMRC and DWP. And the Minister, has, uh, the Minister for uh, Childcare has written to uh, UK government ministers, making clear our need to see some of the legal gateways established um, at a UK level so that that um, better sharing of information can take place. So despite the councils not having that statutory duty, they will in fact as part of this programme, be endeavouring to contact or make known 
the service to all the uh, eligible mothers and so on. We see evidence of that happening already, but Jane may wish to say more about it. No, absolutely, thank you. Um, and just to confirm that, yes, that is our intention. We recognise that, that there's two elements here, that we need to improve our information to parents of two-year-olds and carers of two-year-olds to know they know they have an entitlement, but also we all recognise there is a barrier in relation to the information that's available to local authorities from DWP and HMRC, and actually we want to reach out to families that we don't have a connection with yet to make sure they're aware of their entitlement. That's an important barrier we're all looking to overcome. Colin. Just, just coming to paragraph 32, uh, in the middle of that, uh, it emphasises that research highlighted that councils not knowing the details of exactly who is eligible is a major barrier. Now, that comes back to what you were saying about DWP and HMRC. Clearly, that's going to be a key element to enable you to do this. What if you can't get the information? What if they refuse? Well, frankly, I see no reason for them to refuse because uh, my understanding is that similar data sharing arrangements are in place in other parts of the United Kingdom. So our strong expectation is that the uh, requisite data sharing arrangements will be made available and, and ought to be put in place as quickly as possible. We, as officials and obviously ministers, will be making that case, and it may be that the Parliament would wish to consider what representations it might wish to make. Again, we're working... Sorry. Why are these arrangements not already in place if they're in place, if the data sharing arrangements are in place in other parts of the UK? Uh, there is a gap in relation to Scotland, and we have identified the uh, secondary legislation that would require to be made at a UK level um, in order to put the arrangements in place. That secondary legislation has not yet been enacted. OK, we'll certainly look at that. Colin Beattie. It, having looked at these individual issues, which clearly are fairly important, originally the councils estimated they needed 12,000 WTE staff whereas the Scottish Government estimated between six and 8,000, which is a huge difference. Has that gap been closed? Has the recent settlement uh, satisfied concerns over headcount? So I am pleased to say that I think we are now in the same place in relation to numbers. Perhaps Alison could say a little bit about where we're at in terms of the UK Government's figures and then hand over to Jane for the, for, for the, the for confirmation. Sorry, the Scottish Government. Sorry, Alison will confirm the situation in relation to Scottish Government figures. Thank you. I mean, effectively, we have moved now to one single set of workforce estimates, and that was the product of the <coughs> negotiation and engagement around reaching um, the, the multi-year funding agreement. Um, so we have consensus on the, the revenue funding requirements and, by definition, the, the workforce uh, drivers of that, so in terms of the, the numbers and the composition of the workforce. Um, the Local authority estimates um, reduced um, between the initial estimates in the September finance templates that were reported um, by Audit Scotland and the, the March estimates were sitting at around 9,000 full-time equivalents. There's likely to be some further refinement to that figure because we, we, we jointly agreed an adjustment to revenue funding in terms of population, which will mean that some authorities' assumptions, which means that some authorities will be revisiting their workforce requirements. So can I just but clarify in, one thing yep. there? That 9,000, are those additional to what we have at the moment? Or does it include existing staff? It's additional to, to the workforce that's in place at the moment. Delivering How are you going to recruit 9,000? Um, we have a, a range, a, a programme um, of actions in place um, at, at national and local level. At Scottish Government level, um, we are seeking to create additional training capacity in terms of college and university places. Um, we are funding a 10% year-on-year increase in modern apprenticeship starts, and we've in increased the financial contribution rate um, for uh, for ELC apprenticeships to make them more attractive to employers. Um, we are also delivering a national recruitment campaign. Um, phase one launched in October, targeted at school leavers. Um, phase two. Have you got anything else to add to that? Sorry, we're just quite short of okay, time um, coming. Sorry, so we, we're just looking across where we have, everything is summarised in our workforce delivery plan that we're currently um, engaging with. with okay, I'm going to bring Jane lines. O'Donnell in on that as well, but Ian Gray has a supplementary on this point. I, I just wanted to follow up on the recruitment efforts because the measures which um, Ms Cummins, you've just elaborated, um, were acknowledged in the Audit Scotland report, the 10% increase in apprenticeships, the SFC funding, the additional graduate places. 
but the Auditor General was very clear that she believed it would be extremely difficult to achieve the necessary levels of recruitment. In fact, she says, uh, the Scottish Government councils and training providers urgently need to do more. So my question to you is, now that there's consensus, which is very welcome around the, the numbers that we need to see, over and above the programme elaborated here, what additional measures are the government and local authorities planning to actually get to 11,000? I've, I've got a few people looking at me. Well, Griffin, did you want to speak? Yeah, so I think the demand side of things is a matter of cooperation between the different agencies, the funding, make sure that the places are in place, as Alison Cumming was describing, and then the focus is really on the supply. How do we get out there and persuade people to join the profession? But the Auditor General is saying, even if you fill all the training places on offer, that's not going to deliver the necessary workforce. I'm asking what additional uh, measures are, are planned. I'm not sure that is quite what the Auditor General is saying. Well, um, she says, urgently need to do more. Yes, and, and I understand what she means by that. I don't think she's questioning that the number of training places that have been created are inadequate to the task in hand. I think that relates back to the discrepancy that existed between Council's estimates and our own, which has now been narrowed. Now there's a single figure. We're in the process of assuring ourselves that the numbers of places that need to be created are being created. And then there's a focus on the supply side, which is the reaching out to people through the recruitment campaigns, through making the, the profession a more attractive destination. Ian Gray, did you want to? Uh, uh, well, I think, uh, without asking the Auditor General what she meant in her report, it's quite difficult to come back. She says, uh, in regard to the measures elaborated, this will only provide a very small number of the additional staff that need to be trained. So. Perhaps, it's clearly a difference of view there. Perhaps, Jane O'Donnell, you can tell us, is the 9,000 recruitment figure realistic by the target date? So, yeah, just, just to confirm, it is, it is a joint figure from Scottish Government and Local Government, and we are, we are, we are uh, uh, confident that, that that's a robust figure and it can be achieved. It can, yeah, yes. And what I would say is, in addition to the national work that's being done, there's a lot of local work being done. So we are retraining our existing staff, taking cognizance of the changes in our services that may be required over the next few years and making sure that those staff have uh, a co action plan to move into ELC and to make sure those are the right individuals to deliver quality ELC. So we're not just looking at um, people coming through colleges, we're looking at existing staff. We're also, luckily, because we are the Education Authority, we have access to the, um, our young people and we are able to, at a local level, um, explain just how valuable this role actually is and the career opportunities that are afforded to our, our young people in this area. So we're doing a lot on a local level for school leavers to move into that area as well. And I would emphasise the DYW, Developing Young Workforce Modern Apprenticeships route as well. Also, in relation to that, um, local campaigns will reflect local demographics. So this will look different in Glasgow than it does in Highland, as you would expect. And also we are developing links between the local government online recruitment website and the national website. So we're doing an awful lot in addition to the national stuff. So you're more confident than the Auditor General that you'll be able to recruit all these people by the target date? I can't give a confirmation that we will, but I'm confident that everything's in place for us to do as, mu as much as we can around that. Yeah. Paul Johnson, do you think that'll be achieved? Well, what I wanted to give the committee an assurance is that we are absolutely not complacent about this. And what I hope you've heard about is a really a, a massive amount of collective work being done to ensure that we have got the workforce, not just in the right numbers, but with the right mix of skills and diversity. And what I would also wish to emphasise is this is something we will be actively tracking and monitoring and reporting on um, over okay. the next couple of years and is therefore something which we can continue to engage with this committee and the Parliament on. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Good morning. The initial increase to 600 hours was aimed at improving child outcomes and helping women predominantly back into the labour market. £650 million of public money was provided to deliver this, but a key message that comes out of the report was that there were no measures of success, there was no baseline data, and crucially, and, and I quote, the increase to 600 hours is not expected to lead to a measurable change in children's outcomes. Some might say that there was a fundamental lack of a business case in planning. Would that be fair? And if so, who missed that requirement? I'm happy to um, address that uh, point. The starting point for me would be that this expansion to 600 hours is an expansion that was supported by 
this Parliament um, in the Children and Young People's Scotland Act 2014. So that, was the, that is the legislative underpinning for 600 hours. As you'll appreciate, the Parliament um, received and approved detailed uh, financial information around the time of expansion, and uh, we have got actually two financial memoranda that underpin the bill uh, that were approved by the Parliament. So the expenditure is taking place uh, clearly with the full authority of the Parliament, both in terms of that underpinning legislation and then in terms of the annual budget process. In terms of the outcomes that are being delivered, I think it is important to be quite clear and specific about this point. We are monitoring the outcomes, both short term and longer term. Now, the quote that uh, you have referred to, uh, Mr Kerr, um, is, is with reference to the longer term outcomes. And that material is set out in a Scottish Government uh, report from the end of 2017. I think it's important to look at the, at the extent to which short term outcomes were identified and have been delivered. They're set out in detail in the report. They relate to factors such as quality such as flexibility and, crucially, availability of the 600 hours. What the report does then go on to identify is that it is too early to identify the extent to which those long-term outcomes are, uh, are, are being achieved. Um, those outcomes around oh, Johnson, closing the attainment gap. Can I cut across, just because we are short of time? I appreciate uh, the answer you were giving. Have we got value for money for the £650 million? And how do you know? Well, I think we can point to the delivery of those short-term outcomes that I've referred to. In terms of quality, in terms of flexibility and in terms of provision, we can point to the levels of parental satisfaction, which are helpfully il illustrated throughout the Audit Scotland report. We can see that this is a policy that has not only been supported by Parliament, but has been supported by parents. And we can see the range of evidence that is emerging from parents around the impact that 600 hours is having on the development of their children. Whether has it closed the attainment gap, which of course was one of the, uh, one of the requirements uh, of the increase? Well, as our evaluation sets out, it is too early to say that the investment into 600 hours has had that impact on closing the attainment gap. Two very brief points on that. One, um, our evidence makes clear that what is crucial to look at is the extent to which 600 is, as it were, a stepping stone towards 1140. And we can be, I think, much more confident that the very significant increase to 1140 will have that greater impact on children's outcomes. We also need to look at this policy alongside the range of other government and indeed local government interventions at present okay. that are designed to support better outcomes and closing of the attainment gap. Willie Coffey. Thanks, Kevin. It's just a supplementary on Liam Kerr's question there. Jane, in your opening remarks, you told us that there was a 95% good or better inspection reviews or after the 600 hours was delivered. Could you just tell us a wee bit of the scope of the review? What, what kind of areas did they cover to get such a high satisfaction rate? Happy to, Mr Coffey. So I was referring to the Care Inspectorate report, which was published last year, which said local authorities in the year 2016 on average performed better than other nursery sectors. And actually it's 94%, my apologies, 94% graded, graded good or better on our four quality themes. So that, that was the report I'm referring to. And also just to support what Mr Johnson said there, obviously the parental survey that was undertaken by Scottish Government, the vast majority of parents said not only did they find the quality of the ELC um, high quality, but actually found the benefits of their children they could see that happening so between those two aspects we, f we would say that local authorities have delivered the 600 hours in every single area of Scotland that we are building on the flexibility which was always the plan that we would get 600 in and then extend the ex flexibility and that what has been delivered is of high quality and has parent satisfaction thank you just very briefly, if I might take you back to a line Colin Beattie pursued about the area of the report that says there's no available information on whether children actually attend the places. How do we assess the outcomes for the children if we've no idea if they're actually attending? Well, as I think my colleague Alison has made clear, we're primarily looking at the, the data we have at present is primarily registration data, yes. but we recognise the need to develop and improve that overall data set. Alison, do you wish to add anything to what you said already? Well, I think it would just be to, to reinforce Jane O'Donnell's point that 
um, we're not collecting the level, that information in national statistics, but local authorities and individual settings are actively using that information in terms of how they run their services and, uh, and most significantly in terms of how they support children and their families who are registered with those services. So the, the data is in place at local level. It's just not something that we are presently collecting at national level. Paul Johnson, given the huge investment in this policy, you're not concerned that about the lack of data and the lack of evidence around this? Well, I'm, well I've pointed to the short-term evidence that we already have, which I think is compelling and should not be overlooked. I'm also clear about the work that is underway to demonstrate the long-term impacts of this policy. And I would also point to the um, significant amount of work that is underway at present to ensure that we have very clear baselines um, and, have, and very clear measurements so that we can uh, point to you in future uh, very clear to, to very clear evidence around the impact of So you're of committed expansion. to getting better evidence? We're absolutely committed to the fact that as with the transformational scale of the expansion, so the evidence must, uh, must develop and grow commensurate with that expansion. Okay, Ian Gray. A minute ago that you were uh, confident that the expansion of hours will have a greater impact on children's outcomes. Uh, and the government, I think, have been very clear that the expansion of hours, the primary purpose is to improve outcomes for children. But the Auditor General says there is limited research examining the impact of increasing the number of hours of funded early learning childcare per year for children who already receive it. So I just wonder if you could point us to the evidence that the government have that expanding hours will achieve that objective? Absolutely. There is a strong body of evidence that has existed for some time and that is being developed further around I'm the importance what, of I'm high... I'm you what it is. Well, high qual well um, I'll maybe pass over to my colleague Joe to go through some of the sure. detail there, and if helpful, we can absolutely follow up with, with further. So the evidence on the benefits of early learning in childcare generally is very strong. Um, summarised by the OECD in a series of reports, um, most recently 2017, saying that giving all children access to high quality early education and care will lay the foundations for future skills development, boost social mobility and support I'm inclusive. Sorry, Mr. Griffin, growth. but that's evidence about making childcare, early learning and childcare available to more children. Yeah. I'm asking where the evidence is about expanding uh, the, the hours for those already in childcare. Um, so there's a study which, a longitudinal study of 3,000 children um, from 1907 to 2003 called the Effective Provision of Preschool Education, which largely took place in an English setting, um, that does show that the duration of attendance is important, particularly with an earlier start date under three years of age, which relates to better intellectual development. Okay. Jean O'Donnell. To support that, I think uh, local authorities would say it's not simply the extension of the hours, but it's the quality of the early learning that's going to be provided within those hours. And I would note that Curriculum for Excellence does start at age three. We talk about an early stage, and actually that encompasses our three- and four-year-olds. So we would expect quality early learning. More of that would help to support our, young, our youngest children from the transition from nursery early learning into primary school. Okay. To follow that up, are you arguing then that the expansion of hours will also lead to a commensurate increase in quality. I mean, that would be a very good thing. Because of the focus on the quality of early learning. And I think that was an important thing that we achieved but together, Scottish Government and local government. It isn't just simply an extension of hours. It's not just childcare. Good. The okay. priority is early learning. And that is how local authorities have developed their expansion plans. Is that a change then? I think it was unclear at the point um, when before the policy was developed fully in the blueprint, there was a number of possible options. And as I say, um, I think a, a number of, of the committee members have mentioned there was a, a discussion about whether this was about getting parents into work. And that's, that's a laudable intention. It's important for economic benefits for families. But we have clarified that the primary policy intention is early learning, quality early learning. And that will support the good. reducing the attainment gap. Thanks. That's good that local authorities yeah. are clear on that, because that was something the Auditor General had identified as, as unclear at the outset. Liam Kerr. Sticking with that point that's been made by Ian Gray there, uh, so what other options... We're looking at an increase from 600 hours to 1140 hours. Uh, but what other options have been scoped out and costed which would achieve the same outcomes? Well, I, I think it would be fair to say that what we have is a government 
commitment to move to 1140 I hours. Understand that, I understand, but I, what I, other options were thought about that might have delivered better value for money, for example? Well, the, the reality is that the commitment was there to go for 1140 hours, underpinned by evidence as to the um, benefit of that approach. So we have not, we, we could have spent uh, potentially years looking at a wide range of other options. But what we have taken, uh, what ministers have done, is uh, recognised the evidence around the benefits of, of adopting this transformational, very significant expansion and making it universally available at ages three and four, and have gone for that option, clearly with the, uh, with the support of Parliament. I don't know if my colleagues wish to say anything the, the else evidence, about... The evidence being the study that Joe Griffin referenced that uh, in England, yeah. Certainly that study, among a body of other evidence that would support our approach around high quality uh, and the provision of increased uh, hours. Liam so Kerr. Just for the avoidance of doubt, uh, when you say they went for that option, there were no other options scoped out and costed, were there? We have not scoped out and costed other options. Uh, and have you done any, or has the Scottish Government done any economic modelling on the increase to uh, the 1140 hours of funded ELC and the outcomes to be expected and measured? <laughs> Well, the detailed outcomes frameworks are what I've referred to as uh, work that's very much in development. So we have clarified the overall purpose, as has been stated, around the high quality provision and the primary focus on supporting children and young people and uh, closing the attainment gap. We also recognise, though, the need to be um, working on delivering that economic benefit and ensuring that this policy allows parents to access work and the ways in which we track and measure that will be uh, subject to further development. Uh, and do you have a model in place already? Jane O'Donnell, you were talking about the, uh, the quality that's clearly there already. Uh, but is there a model? If we increase the hours and we increase the staff and we increase the assets and whatever it might be, where's the model that shows the impact of that on quality? Is there one? I don't think I can say that there's a precise model. At, in fact, there is not a precise model at this point in time. That is Does what that requires. Does that concern you, Mr. That, Johnson? Well, what we have is evidence around the benefit of expansion. What we have is uh, wide support uh, from from the Parliament and from uh, wider partners. Um, but not to, evidence on the impact on the quality that's going to be delivered. I think there is evidence around the importance of high quality provision in, um, in improving children's outcomes. Yes. If what you are requesting is a very detailed um, logic model that works through all of the inputs and the outputs that, that, may, that, that are likely to, to, to accrue, then that is uh, in the territory of work that is under development. Jane O'Donnell, are you comfortable with that? So, COSA leaders have signed up to a joint consultation work with Scottish Government around the standards that will be put in place around this. And this piece of work, which is obviously in its infancy and, and has yet to be developed, will allow local authorities and their partners and Scottish Government and other colleagues who, who are scrutinising this service to ensure that we are delivering a high quality of service. Our colleagues in the Quaker Inspector and Education Scotland are developing a joint framework where they will be using that in our new settings to make sure that the expansion is delivering quality. I would mentioned the Curriculum for Excellence, the National Improvement Framework, and obviously the work we're doing to address the attainment gap. We expect that with that high quality early learning and the support from other agencies, we should be able to see a difference in all those areas. So that would allow some monitoring. Okay. Alex Neil. Just following up on that conversation, I mean, obviously uh, it will be 15 to 20 years before we again get a full impact assessment of all the services that are being provided, including the impact of the expansion. Uh, and I appreciate, obviously, that you cannot get a full impact assessment until we see how the life chances when it comes to primary, secondary education, further higher education, employment opportunities, and all the rest of it. But can I ask, uh, clearly we have an increasing problem throughout the United Kingdom, including in Scotland, of child poverty. And child poverty is a major contributing factor to the educational attainment gap. In fact, it's the major uh, contributing factor. Is there any evidence or are you assessing what impact uh, your, these measures are having on 
reducing uh, or containing the increase in the levels of child poverty in Scotland? If, if I could... If I could reply, I think that's a very important point, and I can give this committee an assurance that uh, colleagues in my area who have worked on the child poverty delivery plan have been working closely in partnership with colleagues working on the early learning and childcare increase so that we can ensure that those two policies are proceeding hand in hand and that the upscaling of provision around early learning and childcare, particularly starting with those eligible two-year-olds, will have a positive benefit on child poverty. Uh, but in addition, there are specific measures set out in the Child Poverty Action Plan to spend some of the available resources that have been identified to focus in on those children who are experiencing the greatest level of poverty at present, and to try and ensure that a specific um, offer is given uh, there that will have a beneficial impact there. So it's work that must proceed hand in hand. Joe wishes to add something to that. Well, just to ask the question, I, I accept all of that, uh, Paul, but are you measuring uh, as part of the, the law? I mean, I'm just expecting that this is fairly early years mm. for this mm. expansion, uh, but are you measuring the impact of the additional provision on levels of child poverty? I think that's an important point. It's a challenge that I take away to ensure that the I measurement... It's an important point, but can you answer the question? Well, Are well, you measuring it? Yeah, well, we need to measure it, is what I would, so is, is what I would say. Well, th we're talking about provision that's still to come in. We're talking about a commitment that has just been set out in the Child Poverty Delivery Plan that was published, uh, I think, at the end of March um, to, uh, to make that additional investment for the children who are experiencing the greatest levels of child poverty. What I'm saying is we need to ensure that our measurement frameworks across both of those policies areas are clear and consistent and that is something which I will take away from today. So, very specifically, in terms of our approach to outcomes for 1140, the measures that will start to collate from this summer for two-year-olds will deal with aspects related to potentially child poverty. So in terms of child development, similar to what we do in, in growing up in Scotland, we'll be taking measurements of social and behavioural measures, physical measures and cognitive assessments. And we'll also be taking measures of outcomes for parents around the home learning environment, parents' mental health and well-being, also alongside their employment activity. So to some extent, we'll be measuring the mitigation, the beneficial impacts of the ELC provision for children going through that system and then taking follow-up measures in 2023 after five years of operation. There's also the point about the material improvement in family circumstances from being able to access early learning and childcare that previously they may have had to pay for. We don't have any plans for that at present that I'm aware of, but as Paul says, I think that's something we can take away and certainly not, not late at all to, to introduce into our modelling and into our measurement. That's, that's quite reassuring. Can I, can I move to a, a more practical day-to-day -day issue? And that is, to make this policy work, clearly how each local authority distributes and spends the budget is getting very substantial budget. I mean, we're talking about a billion pounds a year uh, in the foreseeable future. And how those resources are allocated internally within a local authority and use is very important. I have a concern, for example, in the area I represent in North Lanarkshire, where there's apparently been a very deliberate policy of squeezing uh, the resources for the partnership nurseries, the non-local authority providers, to the point where some of these providers who have excellent you know, track records in this area uh, are saying if this continues, they could be forced in the worst case scenario within the next two or three years to actually close the doors. Now, clearly that is unacceptable. Question. So what is COSLA and the Scottish Government doing about people like North Lanarkshire Council? Okay, Bibby, can you answer that question on the finance or do you know, Donald? Um, yes, happy to. I think um, the role of COSLA um, largely is to distribute and allocate and come to an agreement on funding uh, across the local authorities. How that um, is distributed within the local authority is the role for the local authority and COSLA doesn't get um, involved in that detail. What I would add, however, and I, d I don't know the specifics of that, 
case that you're referring to. Um, but what I would add, where we're going to with the 1140 hours is the um, funding following the child. And if any provider meets the standard, um, the parent can decide where their child gets that provision if that provider meets the standard. And that's a key aspect of a change from moving to the 1140 hours. So as long as that provider can meet the standard, um, the uh, parent will be able to place their child. Government, are you monitoring the situation? I mean, I, I know that uh, some ministers uh, have expressed concern privately uh, about what some of the practices are in North Lanarkshire in relation to this. There may be other local authorities that may not be the only one doing this, but it seems to me that you need to track the money and to make sure that children who are in the non-local authority nurseries are not, for whatever reason, going to get any less resource or less attention than those in local authority nurseries. Well, as uh, Becky has said, our approach to funding follows the child is a critical safeguard there, um, I think. But it may be that my colleague Alison wishes to add something. Just, just to add um, two specific points. Um, the, the first is that in relation to the funding agreement that was reached in April, that reflects for each local authority what we would term a sustainable hourly rate for partner providers. So there's an, a collective expectation that the average hourly rate paid to funded providers will increase and that there are funds to support that through the, the funding deal. But the point being made by the partner providers is that's not being passed on. The, the, we have, so are you are uh, going to ensure that local authorities pass it on as you intend them to do? We, we have a joint commitment and what will be key to ensuring sustainable funding is the commitment around payment of the living wage and providing su su sufficient funding to enable providers across all sectors to pay the living wage. That's a core element of the national standard that's out for consultation. That's a joint consultation between Scottish Government and COSLA, which will require um, effectively all uh, uh, all providers in any sector that wish to deliver the funded entitlement will need to meet those criteria but there's an expectation that in return that's a there's a partnership arrangement with local authorities and local authorities but, are undertaking but that's to not, pay sustainable that's not rates. answering the question uh, we, these these partnership nurseries do already pay the living wage that's not the issue here the issue here is there is an unfair allocation being made in respect of the non-local authority partner nurseries. Now, this is Scottish government money. Are you going? These children and the non-local authority ones are effectively getting punished in terms of less resource uh, for whatever reason. Are you going to do something about that? We will be looking. I would say that that there are. Uh, it would be a minority of nurseries in the private sector and the third sector at the moment that are paying their practitioners above the Scottish living wage, um, that they'll all be receiving the, the statutory um, living wage. So there is additional funding going in to support that element. Um, there is a, a clear undertaking for sustainable funding across the piece. We have also but built not, in sorry, an annual... No, can, respect, I, can I come Alison, on to make, an, uh, could you make answer, a point? But answer sorry. the question. Are you going to make sure that the non-local authority nurseries get a fair allocation of the money each local authority gets? Yes well, or no? Yes, we, we will be, right. and there will be arrangements okay. in place Let me bring through the annual financial review. review. Thank you, Ms Cumming. Let me bring Cosla in on that. Who would like to answer that? Just to add for reassurance, the, deli the local delivery plans um, require um, the, pr the private and third sector to help in the delivery. Delivery is not going to be completely from within local authority areas. So um, it will be incumbent upon local authorities to be able to deliver this policy to come to agreements with um, the private and third sectors and come to a sustainable rate. That's what the delivery plans will set out in a local That's area. That's not happening in North Lanarkshire. Okay, I'm, as I say, I'm not aware of the specifics in North Lanarkshire, but um, I don't think there's any um, plans that, um, particularly um, in the mainland, that would um, result in complete local authority um, in-house delivery. So um, local authorities will want to work with partner providers to ensure delivery of the policy. We can look into no, the specific so it's case. Not it's not happening okay. in North Lanarkshire. And, and I think we need to ensure that it does happen everywhere. Well, it is happening in East Ayrshire. There's some good news stories to tell from there. But I really wanted to ask our COSLA colleagues just for a little kind of perspective of how you see it within the local authorities at the moment in terms of their preparedness for premises in particular. 
The issue was mentioned earlier about uh, staffing, and I do know that East Ayrshire are doing what Jane and Donald had described earlier. They're, they're challenging students from the colleges into apprenticeships, and they're also offering existing staff some retraining opportunities as well because of the extent of this investment. But Jane, I wonder if you could give us a little flavour of what your perspective is at the moment in terms of local authorities and their preparedness for premises and so on and so forth? Absolutely. So um, I'll speak from a policy perspective and my colleague, if you want to come in on, in relation to the financial planning. Um, we liaise regularly with our colleagues and directors of education and children's services, so we're aware of um, the, the state of readiness. And I think it's fair to say that local authorities have been champing at the bit to get on with, with what they have to do in order to deliver this expansion. The key date for us was to have the finance in place by the end of April, and we successfully managed to do so and it was, it was a very positive um, and significant amount of money that's gone in. So in terms of the robustness of the expansion planning, as a COSLA officer, I'm content that that is robust and, and fit for purpose. And I know that my colleagues and local authorities are have the determination and the will to get this done. So um, in terms of a, an overall policy perspective, we know it's challenging, but it's doable. And we know that the will and the determination is in place to do so. Maybe just to add to that, the level of work um, that has gone um, into the detail of the delivery plans, and particularly with reference to your question, the capital requirements um, has been considerable. And that was why it was absolutely key to not just get one year funding on an annual basis, it was to get the multi-year funding, which we've secured, so that actually, because the building um, take, is over a number of years, that there was um, agreement around that. And we've got that. Um, now, um, plans can now be committed in terms of the capital delivery, which I think um, has made mitigated a significant risk um, that was in place um, last time you took evidence, but um, we're in a much better place now. It's good to hear that. Where are we on the flexibility issue that many parents raised about taking d different children to different locations? That was raised as an issue and they wanted more flexibility with this. Perhaps Paul could, could answer that, perhaps Jane as well. Yes, <clears throat> certainly. Clearly, with the expansion to 1140 hours, that helps with flexibility simply because there's such a, uh, you know, there's a, there's a much bigger range of hours on offer. And flexibility remains one of the aims of the programme. And it may be that my colleague Alison would wish to add some more specifics around how we will seek to secure collectively that there is as much flexibility as possible. Uh, very briefly, I think that there is evidence, and Jane will want to talk more about this, around increasing flexibility in local authority provision um, in recent years. Um, there's also a point on flexibility that the government's position is that flexibility is best defined through consultation and engagement with local communities, that local communities are best placed to define um, those flexibility arrangements. And we know that the expansion plans have been informed by engagement with local communities. So the local authority services that are being designed will reflect those parental wishes and they'll be bringing in, uh, recognising the flexibility that can be brought from partners in the private and third sectors and childminders to, to add to that. Thanks, Alison. Just to support that then, local authorities have been actively increasing the flexibility of provision um, ever since 2014, and I think the Audit Scotland report points out some important examples of how that's happened. Um, the, the expansion offers us the opportunity to provide something much, much larger in scale in terms of flexibility, and it will be based, as Alison said, on parental expectations and what is appropriate locally. So we know that our colleagues in Highland and the Islands have maybe a different model of flexibility than is required in a city centre, and you'd expect us to take that into account. The robust of the expansion plans is key here, that we've been able to ensure that there will be a variety of um, offers to parents in a local authority area and the, the parent will then be able to choose, as long as they meet the standard, that that's, that, that's, that's available to them. So I'm, we're very confident that that will be a big success of the expansion. Okay. Uh, Caroline Gardner, the Auditor General, gave us evidence on her report uh, just a few weeks ago and she said... Um, that they were, Audit Scotland were not able to identify one council that was doing everything well. Jane O'Donnell, what's your response to that? I think the, the Audit Scotland report identified a number of local authorities who were specialising or leading in certain areas. And what I would say is 
that no local authority is operating in isolation here. Not only do we have excellent support and collective leadership across local government, Scottish government, but within local government itself, we are speaking to each other. So those that led in terms of flexibility or in terms of a multi-agency approach around vulnerable children and families, they have been sharing that information. And I think if you look across the 32 expansion plans, you see a greater sense of consistency where we've identified best practice and tried to implement that across, across the country. Do you, I mean, this is a, a huge investment, but it's also a, a huge target, uh, this expansion of ours. Is it affordable? Do, do, do local authorities have the money to cover this? I think, um, well, yes, we, we, we are content with the funding that's been agreed. Um, I would have to add, from a cost of perspective, this funding is ring-fenced and as we make comments throughout the whole of our budget process, whilst we're confident that the funding is available for this additional early years, we cannot ignore ongoing funding, spending review discussions about core services for local government. Mm -hmm. So um, whilst there's specific ring-fenced funding for this, we cannot forget the links it has with the core local government funding. And of course we'll be engaging on that in upcoming spending reviews, but it's an important point and link to make. Thank you. Bill Bowman. Convener, if I can just pick up on a couple of things said. Um, I think Jane uh, O'Donnell used the term absenteeism and reducing absentee absenteeism. Do you have some um, thoughts of penalising parents whose children don't attend? I absolutely not. No, if, if we have children who are not attending early years for any reason, there may be a, a myriad of reasons that, that that family are struggling to cope. And, maybe, and what we'd want to do is put a range of support around the children and the families rather than any sort of penalisation. In actual fact, you know, we're, we're trying to um, empower parents and children and get them into a much better place. So penalising would, would, would seem um, contrary to that aim. I mean, you also used the term once in a lifetime opportunity, which if you miss, you've lost, I guess. So. Mm. Would your support and information veer towards coercing? No. Again, we, we, we know from, from working with families who may be experiencing a wide range of challenges that actually a more supportive mechanism <coughs> um, works much better for the families and the children and leads to better outcomes. Um, so we would never be looking for, for some sort of uh, penalisation or difficulty there. You, you also used the phrase, I think, um, access to our young people. Um, that concerns me slightly in that, are you suggesting that you would say to teachers that they should direct people into social care or child care? So happy to clarify. No, I suppose what I was saying was as education authorities, our young people are within our schools and are actively asking um, their career for careers advice and guidance. And what we can do is say to a young person who might say, I'm quite interested in early years, that looks like a good thing for me. We can say, well, actually, we can help you move from school into an apprenticeship into a permanent role and actually we can help you with your college and training and make those links as we do under the Developing Young Workforce Programme. It's quite a unique role the local authority has here and it's, it's a benefit for our young people. But you need to keep a balance between other potential careers. Indeed and actually we want to see a diverse workforce as I think my colleagues have mentioned so while we actively want to ensure that we're supporting young people into employment and this is a great opportunity uh, and a, a hugely valuable role in society we also want to see a wider variety of people coming into the workforce. Okay thank you for your thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you convener just briefly to return to a couple of the points that uh, Mr Neil and Ms Mara have put forward I have a report which to be fair is a year old uh, which says that 85% of nurseries say that local authority funding for free hours doesn't cover their costs uh, and over half say that they expect to break even or make a loss and as a result three quarters of them uh, plan to increase their fees to parents. Now if that comes to pass isn't there a danger that uh, we end up pricing people out uh, and achieving negative outcomes to both attainment and work? Who wants to answer that? What, well, what, I'm, I'm start by making clear that that um, I'm, I don't have the specifics of the report in front sure. of me, but that report, as I understand, is commenting on the existing situation. And what my colleagues have pointed to is the range of work that is underway now to ensure that there is sustainable funding for the whole sector. 
and um, the, the work that will be undertaken that clearly this Parliament will be examining over the next two years to ensure that that is taken forward in a spirit of real partnership with all providers. I think it's very clear that although we are here from Scottish Government and local government, this is not something that we are simply doing ourselves. Um, and I can point to other governance arrangements which we have in place that are seeking to take a really inclusive approach to the work that we're taking forward over the next two years. That will be alongside private providers, uh, childminders and others to try and ensure that collectively we make this a uh, success. Now, I don't know, Alison may wish to add something. Do you have anything new to, to add to that? Yeah, just very briefly. Um, I, I understand that's probably the NDNA survey which predates the blueprint response in March 2017. So the, the, the commitment to sustainable funding was not as explicit then as it is now. We now have a funding agreement which, which um, makes um, it the, the sustainable funding for all providers, including payment of living wage. Um, the, the second point is in terms of that sustainable funding is also um, sufficient to ensure that parents don't have to pay any charges towards their funded entitlement, and that is explicit in the national standard that we're consulting on with COSLA at present. Thank you, Bibi. So, Alison picked up the, the point it was going to make on the, on the standard, but probably just to add, um, fundamental to the successful delivery is partner providers in the provision. Um, local authorities will not price partner providers out because it is fundamental. The success of this um, is to have partner providers with that and they've been working very closely with partner providers. Thank you. Ian Gray. So, uh, uh, that's just a point of clarification. Um, uh, it's slow in finding my own notes, but when we spoke about um, workforce, the increase in workforce, um, and there's a very welcome agreement ac across COSLA and the Scottish Government. I think the figure that was given was 9,000 additional full-time equivalents, but the Minister, in her statement on the agreement with COSLA, used the figure 11,000. I just wonder what the... Yeah, sure. it's, it's a difference between full-time equivalent and headcount. So the 11,000 figure is the headcount number. Um, a large proportion of the workforce um, work below part-time hours or work flexible patterns or, or term-time patterns. So that's the, the explanation. Okay. Willie Coffey. Thanks, again. I meant to ask this question earlier. I, I know that East Ayrshire have already run <coughs> a successful pilot of the 1140 at the new Hot Riggs Primary in Kilmarnock. Has there any other authorities tried the, the 1140 so, so far? And what, what have the results been? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. I'll take, I'll take that answer. Yeah, a number of local authorities have um, run the 1140 um, and also in, in different um, offers. So they've, they've run the 1140 um, blended approach between childminders and nurseries, across partner providers, etc. So we've learned from all those trials and all those er early work. Um, I think you'll, you'll be able to see across our 32 expansion plans that actually um, all, all local authorities have tried a little bit of expansion and those who have done the full 1140 have shared their findings. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that. Can I thank you all very much indeed for your evidence this morning. I now close the uh, committee's uh, public session. Thank you. Thank you.